Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Change Itself. Uh, glad to have you guys uh, tune in once again for an excited episode. And uh, if, we're, if you're new or if you're just catching us off a, uh, off a random link, you can find us on changeitself.com. Uh, we'll guide you to our YouTube channel and our upcoming shows. Uh, or you can find us on linkedin.com under Change Itself. And uh, you'll be able to uh, like our, our page, subscribe, and uh, comment, and, and follow along as we... Uh, Go down the path of, of finding out uh, new ways, innovative ways to uh, to instill change um, and how to uh, to cope with it. Uh, today we have a great episode with uh, Jason Lee from SmartCo, uh, where we'll be having a great discussion around uh, critical process verification. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of us have uh, quite a bit of, quite a bit of experience with this when it comes to you know considering the plan, do, check, tax cycle. And what we want to do in our organizations, and Jason's got a very innovative way to think about things. Uh, so, Jason Lee, welcome aboard. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. It's exciting for us to be on the show too, and you know, working with you, Gus, and the gang has been great. So, we look forward to the episode. Right on. Thanks. So, yeah. So let's let's just dive right into it. And uh, and for anybody that's been with us before, Eric is on holidays, uh, you know, finishing up his home for for the winter. So I've uh, I've been tasked to to run solo today. So hopefully we. Uh, we get the job done properly. You guys stay entertained. Uh, but J- Jason, so I know we, we've had quite a few conversations around, you know, there's a lot of innovations going on as far as making sure, are we doing the right things in the workplace? Do we have right. the right perimeters or parameters set up in the workplace for people to succeed? How are we supporting the workforce? Like all these things are coming together uh, and the, the volume of, of information is growing and growing with all kinds of technologies and innovations that are coming uh, our way, anything from proximity detection to uh, gate alerts to uh, making sure that you're authorized to access different areas. Um, and, and we've had quite a few conversations about how that comes together and how you're working on something that's very unique um, and, and very intentful with uh, critical process verification. So maybe if you want to dive right into that, explain to me more about what that, what that is and what it is for breakfast. So smart cone itself is a inherently a safety product. The term cone, part of the safety, is, refers to a pylon, although a lot of our products aren't actually in a pylon. Just the name stuck really well. However, uh, you know, safety as a business model is a very difficult thing to do. So we found a way to take safety data and information and make it operational so that companies can decrease their expenses and increase their revenue while using a smart cone and then safety is the added bonus. So that's how we do our, our business model and help organizations get to that safety line quickly, effectively, and while taking cost and you know safety all in, in the same thing. It's really a unique approach. However, um, the really cool stuff we do is how do you take safety and make it repeatable, which is the other thing, right? People have lots of safety systems and it's almost like safety is a brute force pain where you have to get people to fill out forms or training and training and training. And yet some still sometimes things happen and, um, and it's frustrating, right? People didn't do the job right or whatever it is. And I was talking to one of our, uh, one of our clients, they were saying, you know, it's really difficult to have people do their jobs right. And it's our business is critical on people doing their jobs right. So how do we how do we do this critical process verification piece, which ensures that people do things right every time, all the time? And my response to them was, well, you know, you, you have to consider the human condition, right? Like we have to understand people better before we start developing safety systems. And there's a reason for that. You know, the, the technologies evolved so well that we're repeating some of the ways that people do things like AI, for example, right? We have our own internal AI and we do the same thing. The other thing that human beings do that, uh, like a solar powered system, for example, shuts down certain processes to save energy, right? Technologies, tra- we do that purposely. To, well, your body does that too. You know, your body is designed to conserve energy. So if you're on an eight hour shift doing the same thing over and over again, your internal intelligence will start finding muscle memory and things to do. So you can start shutting down, you know, high processing tasks and all these things and become automatic, which is where safety starts to fall apart. Because if you're not paying attention and you need to pay attention, then you're you're sitting in a situation, it's a a ticking time bomb. So it's not fair 
to ask people to be paying attention for an eight hour shift on something related to safety. It is exhausting for a human being to pay attention constantly. We all drive to work. We forget how we got there. We stopped at all those red lights and we turned corners, but you were thinking about something else. You don't remember. Exactly. Our, our bodies are designed to do that. So by saying to somebody, you didn't do your job right eight hours a day, but that's an impossibility. It is not going to happen. Our bodies are designed to shut those systems down to save energy and be efficient. So some of our safety procedures are defeating the human condition, but it's no surprise that they don't always work. So now there are ways to wake you up out of your shut, like wake those systems back up so you're paying attention. That's where we need to focus our attention. That's where we need to develop our solutions. And every animal, by the way, like we're an animal, obviously, but every animal works the same way when it comes to communicating. It's a process of three things happen, a pre-cue, a cue, and then the thing you're supposed to do, whether it's motivation, event, or a, a flick of a switch or whatever it is. One, two, three. The first thing just wakes your attention up, but there's no context to it. It's like, what was that? What's happening? You're supposed to be doing something in a few minutes. Oh yeah, what am I supposed to do again? Oh yeah, I hit this button. Three things. Every creature follows the same pattern. I know that from being a professional animal trainer. That's one of the things we learned about how to create condition response and behaviors and all these things. And also there's another human condition, which is called combined animal behavior. If for example, you had a crowd of people and there was a light flashing, everyone's going to look at light going, is someone going to do something about that? They're not going to just spring into action. It's like the, the Samaritan law from the Bible, right? Where everybody sees somebody getting hurt and everybody thinks someone else is doing something about it. Meanwhile, nobody did anything about it. And that phenomenon is a combined animal behavior. Another good example is that a traffic light. If you have a traffic light and you have a left turn signal and a straight signal, the left guy goes first. The guy who's going straight starts to edge forward, even though the light is still red, because we're paying more attention to the herd than we are to the signals because we're a herd animal. That's what we do. We group up in herds and what's happening around us is really important. And we take that in feedback. Well, when you start understanding that, that safety and communications of any kind works in three steps, one, two, three, and also the herd dynamics are also important. And you take those two frameworks and build them into a safety platform. Then you're actually using the human condition to improve your safety versus here's a form to fill out and you hit the red button on the way out the door. Right. What? I walked in the door, forget to do the form, forget the red button. I thought I hit it. You know, today I put my keys over here. And when I did that, it screwed up my pattern, my muscle memory. And now I forgot something and bingo, we have a safety incident. This, these, everyone has stories like that because it's the human condition. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It means our training is bad. It means our approach is bad. We are not considering how to make people safe. And that's the study we've been doing for about 30 years. So we took that same notion to our partnership with Disney, who also understands the human condition. You can imagine they do 10 million rides a day and their safety stats are in the 0 0.0000001 mistakes across a global operating profitable business that everybody goes to and comes back going, that was amazing. Okay. Well, there's 250,000 cast members working under safety programs constantly. And so, you know, they have figured that out. And so we licensed their safety approach called critical process verification with performance alignment. And, and that has a process of developing these safety patterns that take that human element into it by linking it to the bottom line of the organization for profitability, you know, success and safety all with making sure it's a sustainable safety program. And so uh, where SmartCoin comes in with that is that we have multiple sensors. We deploy all sorts of different safety devices that have lights and audio messages, nudges, and all sorts of different things that make that interaction with the human condition possible. So we can say we can provide safety automatically, you know, just hitting those automatic responses to people and cueing them the right way. And that's the work that we do. And it's super exciting.
Every worker deserves to go home safely at the end of the day. Book a demo with Sophie to discover how their groundbreaking EHS management software empowers workers to proactively avoid hazards and how organizations like yours can cultivate a stronger work culture. Visit them at sophie.com to learn more. Technica Mining is a premier underground mining and construction contractor. They stand for delivering quality project work on time and on budget through innovative thinking. Their excellent safety record, experienced workforce, and large equipment fleet will guarantee the timely completion of all your project needs. Trusted by the world's leading mining companies, Technica Mining has over 20 years of experience in mine construction, development, and production. Contact Technica Mining to take your next mining project to the next level. Visit them at technicamining.com. Change Itself is produced by Crownsman, the voice of industry. Check out more, including The Crownsman Show, Mining Now, The Building Energy Show, and Agriculture Now at crownsman.com. I guess it falls along the lines of like the gamification, right? Like everybody's asking you to gamify uh, your systems because, you know, we found that, you know, the humans, are, we're just addicted to kind of winning and we're addicted to like, beating hard things so so if the game is too easy we give up the game is too hard we give up but if it's a combination of some easy stuff some hard stuff um i know because i've been playing angry birds for years now for no reason other than just <laughs> want to get to the next game and it's not because it's a great game it's just, i don't know i just got addicted to it so so i mean and it, and it touches on a, something that's very very near and dear to 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 me and to many in inspectors a lot of times when you look at okay root cause analysis right and or or whatever methodology to your five whys, whatever you want to dive into, and you start looking at okay, why did this scenario occur? And I would tell you, if you start looking back at all the data of all the times that we've done this, is well, the worker forgot to do this, or the supervisor did not do this, or you know, employee. You look at key words that keep coming up, and we somehow always kind of gravitate into blaming a person for not right. going through and not delivering on something rather than taking a look at okay before the person had the opportunity to even perform there's a lot of steps that we're taking before that as far as the planification yep. the, uh, the risk assessment uh, making sure that all the right controls were in place making sure the right tools were in their hands making sure they had the right things like even down to now we put like anti-fatigue mats like even to go on a train show now like I'm going to start bringing anti-fatigue masks because you know you you can't you tend to wander around because it's uncomfortable to stick in one place, and then you miss an opportunity, right? Because you're right. all right. around. Um, so it, it is a very interesting topic to touch on as far as how do you almost gamify the person? <laughs> you know, what I mean, with the technology, you're gamifying the person at this point to uh, to keep keep the lights on. And we understand uh, things when we're building AI systems, for example, right? We uh, we look at how do we make the computer successful? And we know the limitations of the computer. So, but we don't make the computer wrong. We're like, well, the computer shuts down. So we've got to keep it awake. You know, the computer needs these, these objects to make it work. So we give them to them. We never say the computer didn't do its job. Nobody ever says that, but the outcome is the same. Instead, we focus on how do we feed it and how do we program it? So it's going to work successfully every time. But yeah, exactly. And so taking the exact same methodology into what we're talking about and setting people up for success and understanding the human condition and getting rid of the blame game. You know, if somebody didn't follow a safety procedure, to me, that's the, that's the company's problem. That is not the person who did this problem. It is, you know, look at the safety system, look at how and how, what did you do to ensure the success of the safety program by augmenting the human condition to make it so that it just happened every time, all the time, automatically. We don't think like that normally. We think like safety is a standard. So let's do the minimum that we need to do to adhere to the standard because that's what we're forced to do. And that's how we think about safety. But that gets into the operational side. You know, I can just imagine all the safety officials going, this is awesome. But you know what? We don't have any budget to do that. We can't go AI safety. Like, where are we getting the money from? But that's true. I understand the condition. But that's where being innovative of having a multi-use uh, case safety product. Because why don't we do asset tracking while we're providing safety? Why don't we coordinate other maintenance activities while we're doing safety? Why don't we build the safety element into every piece of technology that we have so that the safety piece is just a bonus? And what we're really spending our money on is running our business profitably. 
And that's that's exactly why you know, large organizations are coming to Smart Cone because that's how we think. Safety should be the bonus that's inherently added to whatever business model we're driving and whatever technology we're doing to solve a problem to make money. And safety should be the free part. And so that's that's a change in, in shifting. It's a mental change in shifting, right? It's a culture now. Safety right. should be the culture, not the thing you're spending money on. We just need to understand that, right? We just need to get the message out. We need to show people how to do it. And then it'll just become part of our daily activities. Yeah, no, and it, and it touches on something that, you know, I, I talk about all the time. And that's why probably we get along so well is we, we, we see things the same way. And, and when I have, you know, these long conversations with organizations about how can we achieve compliance, right? And I would say, to why, so why at this point do you think that compliance is the goal? Like compliance should never be the goal. Compliance should be the natural default based on your system. So, you know, you you design an ISO framework, but you don't use it, or you design a health and safety framework, and then people don't know where it lives. It's living somewhere on a, on a shelf somewhere. So, so then by default, because nobody knows and understands, you know, the the basic fundamentals of how you said you were running your business, um, or how you're going to do work uh, with integrity, then compliance becomes a goal rather than the natural course of events. And, uh, and the same thing with, with our technology is that's what we're seeing now. Is now we're seeing reports of 150, 180, 200% compliance. Right. Right? Why? Because now they've got all of the tools and elements in proximity of their day-to-day work every minute of every day. That's right. And, it, and, it, and it, you know, compliance becomes a natural default. Uh, exactly. Rather than the goal. So... Very it's something you can do by by going to that muscle memory and your internal system shut down because now it's an automatic thing. And, and that's exactly right. You know, I have kids and the kids have a cell phone and the kids are supposed to do their chores to pay for the cell phone and they really want the cell phone, but they don't really want to do the job. And I'm like, if you're not compliant, you don't get the cell phone. But it's so hard for them to vacuum or whatever. And really, if we had started that off when they were babies and just Here's how the world works. It would never have been a question. And if we made it so it was an automatic thing and it was easy to do, it never would have been a question. But now we're trying to inject that in the stream of their existing behavior. And there's always a battle. They intellectually understand you have to work to get the phone. They get that. But when it comes time to do it, oh, my goodness, it's a pain. And, you know, some of those safety systems pre, you know, what you're talking about by embedding of the culture that if they're so far removed from the work they're doing now, it's just like my kids in the phone. I hate filling this form out. I hate doing this. I don't want to do any of that. I just want the phone. And so we need to flip that. So it just becomes a, yeah, I do the phone. I, I cut the grass. I do this. I do that. I get my phone. It's all good. Life is great. That's a culture shift. And then that's what we're talking about. Yeah. No, and, and you bring up a good point. And I think as far as like, you know, what we can, what we can leave uh, as a, as a closing statement to what we're talking about today. We always talk about environments where projects exist. They are breeding grounds for innovation and, and for yeah. what you want the future to look like. Because a project has a start, a middle, and an end. And you're able to say, okay, we're going to start the project in this way. And then we're going to see it through. And then we're going to end it this way. So for everybody joining in on that project, this is just the way it is. It's the way of being. Right. No different than now you've done this since you were born. It, it's just how it is. But if you say, let's take the same thing and put it into your day-to-day that you have right now, and we don't call it a project, and we just say, this is what's going on in your day-to-day, then there's massive resistance. Or no different than if, it, if, it, if somebody quits an organization and starts with the next organization, that organization could do things completely different and it's just what's so, and, the, and then people working there just buy into it, and then they go. Whereas if you try to instill what this company is doing in this company, massive confusion, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's quite uh, so. Quite surprising. When we started, um, when I started SmartCom back in the late uh, 2010 timeframe, um, we, the concept of smart Home, we didn't actually form the business until 2015, but the technology has been under development since, uh, since uh, mid-2009. And um, so two, two things were, uh, were kind of in my focus. One was intelligent infrastructure, because if we can use technology embedded all around this, then that could nudge us to do something successful, right? So that, that was that piece. But the other part 
is called what I call virtual instinct. You know, if somebody does something instinctually, they just, oh, I'm supposed to do this. Hmm. And so if you actually used your infrastructure to cue people, just reminders, you know, like my dog, here's the cookie jar. It knows a cookie's coming. So all it needs is a little jingle of the cookie jar and poof, it's right there, right? Like Pavlov's law. So if you actually had your infrastructure just subtly nudging people and they go, yeah, well, well you know what? I got to do this. It becomes more of an instinctual thing. They don't really remember how they know or why they know, but they heard the whistle and bang, they kick into gear, do something the right, the right way. And so that's called virtual instinct. So when you get that muscle memory training and how a job is done and you tie that into your infrastructure to nudge people on what to do, these are just queuing. And I, people love that, by the way. It sounds like it sounds worse than it really is. People love the having the certainty of a decision. If yeah. I'm running down, doing something, carrying something, and something goes, a light flashes, and I know how to turn, it's great to do that because that's how you get athletic performance, right? Athletes do the same thing. They run a the full, they go. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They go full board. They go full board to win. They just want to win and get it done. They don't want to make the 15 decisions from here to there. That's That's a waste of time. If they can get performance out of it and they can just enjoy their life, they can stay back and shut these systems off. They don't need constantly and be successful and feel good about it. Everybody wants that. So, you know, it's going to take some time to get there, but we know that's how it works and we have technology to do it. So now it's about mapping that out. And that's what critical process verification is all about. No, that's awesome. No, that's awesome. Uh, you know, thanks. Thanks again for joining us today, Jason. And, and for the audience that, you know, they're tuning in and they're, Kind of catching this for the first time they'll probably have to watch it a few times because it, it is it is it is a massive shift um how do they get a hold of you well, how do they reach you and and how do they extend the conversation you can go to uh triple w the and just send us an email there's also a press release out there about critical process verification so if they search that on google they'll find that on google and then reach out you'll see some videos and things on our website and we're always here to talk, and I love talking about it. So if anybody ever want to have a video call on it, yeah, I could talk for hours about it. <laughs> so it is a lot of fun, right? It's something worth getting into. It is worth it. I mean, when you when you look at those videos, like you know, I, I don't know if you've seen that video of the, the lady that was uh, it was like an experiment where they had the beep in the waiting room. Oh yeah, no, I've seen it. So what they did is uh, they what they did is they put a couple of people in their reactors, and there was a beep that was going on in the waiting room, and they just stood up, and there was a new person that came in. And she saw everybody stand up. So the first beep, she didn't stand up. Second beep, she was like, okay, I guess we stand up at the beep. And then she starts, and then they started pulling away all the actors until she was the only one standing up for the beep. And then new people from the street came in, right? And then they're looking at her. Why is she standing up in the beep? Don't ask, they don't ask any questions. They don't even, she's like, I don't know, I'm just standing up. Next thing you know, she's got an entire room standing up with her at the beat for no reason at all. Other combined than animal that. behavior, baby. It's combined animal behavior. That's thanks for saying that. I got to watch that video. That's a yeah. perfect example of how you build safety in a company to make it repeatable. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link, and Gaudi will we'll put the link in our in our <laughs> video as well. Um, so it, again, thanks a lot for joining us today, Jason. And I'm sure everybody got a lot of uh, the conversation. And uh, until next time, we'll see everybody on the next episode. And don't forget to ring that bell, send us your comments and, uh, and let us know what you think. And we're looking forward to uh, producing more great content as we go forward.